And uh, I've been informed that the jury has reached a verdict uh, prior to receiving the answer to the question that it sent up. And is, is this verdict unanimous? Would you hand the verdict forms to Cindy, please? Mr. Edwin, would you please stand up? Jury verdict count number one, murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count number one. Be quiet, please. Murder in the second degree. Jury verdict, count number two, child abuse. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count two, child abuse. Further, we, the jury, find that with respect to the verdict question as to this count, as follows. Did the child abuse result in death? The answer is yes. And you heard that reaction inside the courtroom. And, and these moments are unlike any other moment because, you know, you've got uh, victims that are in, in invested in seeking some level of justice because that's all that they can get at the end of the day. That boy's not coming back. But this is your one chance for justice. And, and you have, you never know, though, what, what the verdict is going to be. I mean, you just don't know. We've been surprised here at Court TV many times. I've been shocked. I've been floored uh, by verdicts that I've seen and heard through the years. Uh, and sometimes you go in expecting one thing or yeah, how could they think anything else? But you never know until you know. And, and now the jury has spoken there. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. We've got some really experienced trial attorneys joining us in New York, New York, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernard Avialona in Cleveland, Ohio, criminal defense attorney and law professor at Cleveland State, Ian Friedman, and in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Brian Watkins. You can also see Brian at uh, brianwatkinslaw.com. You can contact him, brianwatkinslaw.com. A lot of experience on, on, on this panel, um, a ton. Let's just talk for, before we get into this particular trial, let's just talk about that moment, okay? And I'd be really interested. Um, Bernard, you've tried so many cases. How many times going in do you know what that verdict is going to be? Or do, do you ever go in and think, oh, I, I know what this verdict is going to be? Like, we never know for sure, right? I understand that. But how often are you surprised, are you taken back by what the jury has said? Look, Vinny, in the cases that I've done, I know what the verdict should be, but I'm not confirmed that that is actually going to be the verdict. Because the thing is, with jury trials, you just never know what 12 people from different backgrounds are going to decide in the case. So I'll tell you this, Vinny, the one point where I'm always nervous, and actually the only time I'm nervous doing a jury trial, is when I get that call that there is a verdict because you just don't know what that verdict is going to be, even though you know what it should be. I see uh, Ian and Brian both smiling. Uh, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, it's, it's always scary. I, you never know. You think you know. You think that they heard you the way that you wanted them to hear you. Uh, but when you get that call, just like Bernardo said, terrifying, walking over to that court, it's always a long walk. You're walking with your client oftentimes. The jury comes in, you're watching all their eyes. Are they looking at you? Are they looking at your client? That's a good thing. If they're not, that's a bad thing. So, you know, it's always a surprise. I could count on one hand the number of times that I've celebrated the night before uh, the verdict. Most of the time, you just never know. Brian? You know, there's only one time that you really do know is when you get a jury question, and the jury question pretty much says, oh, you know, if we convict him of this, can we convict him of this too? And things like that. And that's when you know. But other than that, it's tough. And that's why 98% of all cases, both criminal and civil, settle. Because people like to resolve their situations. They don't want to put their hand in, in, in the hands of 12 jurors because you don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, I always felt like at that moment, like I had no more control. Right? There's nothing else I could do. And, and we're sort of control freaks as attorneys, right? We're fighting over what evidence can go in, what questions are going to be asked, what arguments are made. And then once they have it, we can't do anything. All right, let's get into this case now. I want you to take a listen to the closing argument from the uh, DA in, in this case because he, 
He spoke at time about motive, and I think in a case like this where it's a father murdering a son, motive is important. It's not an element, but it's important. I mean, this jury has to understand why on earth would a father kill his own son. Let's take a listen. But whether it was the diaper pictures, which had obviously an impact on Dylan and Corey, both were terribly disturbed by seeing their dad like that, or whether it was Dylan just saying something. The defendant had had enough. And we know with the pictures what that meant in their lives. So when it comes to the pictures, Corey Redwine took the stand and testified under oath. And he told you Dylan lost all reason to look up to his father on that day. It's no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that the last person seen with Dylan, the last person with Dylan, when he's last heard from, also happens to be alone and angry with Dylan. It is a broken and toxic relationship, not just with Dylan, but also with the rest of the family. And in some ways, this is about more than the anger the defendant has at Dylan. And what he does is more than just anger at Dylan. It is rage at the family situation. And ultimately, that's what this case was all about, Ian. This was about, um, you know, a, a bitter breakup. Children are caught in the middle of all of this. But then you've got this, this, he mentioned the diaper pictures. These things are disgusting, revolting. We're talking about a grown man, and, and he's taking pictures. Uh, there's pictures of him. All right, I'm going to say it, all right? You can close your ears if you want. He's like eating out of the diapers. And, and it's not like they're putting food in the, in the diaper. It's gross. It is disgusting. And his sons had seen these pictures. And, um, you know, to me, you paint that picture of the defendant, he's not getting the benefit of any doubt. You know, if there's evidence that can link him here, and they had some of this forensic evidence to link him to all this, this guy is, he's, he's an outlier, right? There's, there's something wrong with him, and it makes it, from my perspective, someone who's much more likely to commit murder of his own son is someone who's engaging in bizarre behavior like this. Yeah, I mean, you're saying it's spot on. Half that jury, just like half the country, has been divorced. Most of them have had custody battles, right? but they don't kill their kids as much as they may be battling with uh, their ex. So you really have to show why this is a special sort of person, a different sort of person, not like you or I or anyone else who's in a bad custody battle. And yeah, the person who's dressed up like that, the person who's eating, I'll say it too, feces from a diaper, that is the sort of guy that can commit this offense. That is the sort of guy who is going to do that despite their ex. And so you're exactly right. That's a, a person that a jury's not going to be able to re relate with when they say, yeah, I had a bad divorce too. No, this is a whole special sort of universe with this guy. And, and Brian, the other part of this, this all played out on a very um, big national stage on the Dr. Phil show. I mean, while his son is still missing, he's appearing on Dr. Phil with his ex. This guy is just... Um, you know, I, I don't understand it. I, I, and I guess what it is, and we say this all the time about a courthouse, is the most dangerous courtroom in a courthouse is not the criminal courtroom. It's, it's, it's the family court uh, where the emotions just bubble up. And this is beyond anything. But it all played out on Dr. Phil as well. You know, crazy defendants like this, actually, when you have a crime such as heinous as a father killing his son, they actually walk into that courtroom at first with the presumption of innocent. And I say that because people first say, oh, there's no way. Nobody would kill their own son. There's no way. And yet, when you, you, know, when you unfold the evidence and you're able to add additional evidence, like the guy's eating feces out of a diaper, then it all comes together and the cards all fall into place. You know, the, the guilty verdict came back pretty quickly. So, you know, he... People killing their own children, people don't want to believe it, but, you know, sometimes you got to. This one, Bernard, it almost seemed like this would be the fact scenario in a bitter breakup between a husband and a wife because it's, the, the, you know, there's something going on in that relationship. And I just can't imagine, because he's a, he's, a he's a young kid. He's not, 
He's, he's not like a 25-year-old. He's not an adult, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's the relationship that is broken, and the father just takes it out on this poor kid. Absolutely, Benny, but you got to think the evidence was so enormous in this case in terms of what type of relationship that they had, because in the case, they were able to show that the son was texting a mom. It's like, look, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be with that. And then for Red Wine, he didn't want his biggest secret to be revealed to the public. So what other reason that motive itself was strong enough for the jury to be like, oh, no, this guy killed his son, and this is why he killed his son, because the information is just so appalling and just so horrendous. So the jury saw exactly and called Red Wine exactly what he is, is guilty. So even though Red Wine put on a defense case and tried to say that his son was killed by like a scavenger by animals and not a human being, the jury found that, you know, full of pieces. Let's take a, a little listen to part of the defense closing argument today. We stand shoulder to shoulder, Mr. Mark Redwine, because it's our honor to stand with someone who's wrongly accused. It's our honor to defend someone and fight and object and argue and introduce evidence. It's our honor to do that especially in a case where someone's been wrongly accused and the evidence is so thin and the emotions are so high. The not guilty verdict from this case flows from the evidence in this case. The lack of evidence in this case, science, the testimony, and the not guilty verdict flows from what you know about this case now. You guys have become experts on what's going on in this case, more so than probably a very small number of other people in the world. And it's what you know about this case, not what the prosecution wants you to think happened in this case, not what the prosecution wants you to speculate about what happened in this case, but what you know from the evidence and lack of evidence. All right, here's the slight problem I have with this particular lack of evidence argument, okay? And, and I understand there's a presumption of innocence and lack of evidence is a valid defense in any case, right? Because the prosecution has to prove it. But when you've got care, control, and custody of your child, and to me, leaning back on the lack of evidence really is a lack of a defense. Uh, that's, that's the way I see it, Brian. You know, you're right. You know, he didn't have a lot to work with, but, you know, he had a crazy client. And it's tough. It's tough in a situation like that when you have to come up with something and you kind of got to fall back on the prosecution didn't prove their case. You know, and the problem is, is when you got a murder, a heinous murder like this, the killing of your own son, you needed to put on, I mean, legally speaking, you don't have to put on a defense, but reality speaking, he needed to put on a defense and prove that he didn't do it, and he didn't come close to doing that. Yeah, he's got care, control, and custody of this child. He's in the middle of nowhere. There's, there, you know, these other explanations didn't make much sense to me. Anyhow, um, he's convicted. Time to move on, turn the page. When we come back, we'll take a look at what's coming up Monday, the next live trial here on Court TV out of South Carolina involving a college student. Uh, she does the right thing, the responsible thing, calls for a ride share to get home, but gets into the wrong car. We'll have that story when we come back.